I speak to you in the name of God, the holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Anyone who has been fortunate to accumulate many trips around our sun knows that the older we get, the more we get acquainted with death. My 95-year-old grandmother has outlived almost all of her generational peers, and she has shed more than her share of tears for loved ones who have ended their sojourn on earth with the hope of heaven in their hearts. It's not that we have to be chronologically old to come to terms with the reality that we will all die. But being able to hold the tension between acknowledging death's door and living as a new people, unafraid of the transition into larger life that we call resurrection, that takes work. And it is the domain of the spiritually mature regardless of age. On this All Saints weekend, as we stand on the cusp of a national election, and as we prepare to receive and confirm members of Christ's larger body, it seems appropriate for us to explore these tensions that surround us, that befuddle us, and often animate us as humans seeking to live into the realm of God that Christ reveals to us. Because even though living as though these tensions didn't exist might be simpler and more attractive, eventually we all must come to terms with the fact that life on earth is never just black and white, never just male or female, never just Democrat or Republican, never just new or old, never just heaven or hell. Today in our readings, we hear the prophet Isaiah proclaiming the vision of God's abundant feast to a people who were well acquainted with food insecurity and famine, and announcing that death will be swallowed up to a people all too familiar with loss of life. We hear in Revelation of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. While the Roman Empire's temporal power was cresting, and we hear of a promise that the home of God is among us rather than in some far off humanly inaccessible realm. And the tension between death and life could not be starker than at the heart of this scene from John's Gospel, where Jesus calls his friend Lazarus out of a tomb into resurrection and instructs the gathered community to unbind him and let him go. In all three readings, we are being reminded that our life in God involves no small level of faith and an even greater capacity to trust that following Jesus into the complexity of resurrection in a world well acquainted with death and tears is the way to know heaven's geography in the here and now. a dualistic messiah, out of touch with the lived experience of real humans, might have remained stoic and unmoved at the complaints of Mary and Martha and the loss of Lazarus. But we get Jesus. Thank God we get this Jesus that weeps with those who weep and has the resurrection power to swallow up death forever. We get the Jesus who reminds us that wise scribes bring out treasures old and new to enable others to access the joy of the reign of God, not just the old, 
and not just the new. We get the cosmic Jesus who both sits on the throne in the new Jerusalem, whose crystal river feeds the leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations, and the hyper-personal Jesus who offers living water to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. The Jesus that we are called to follow in our baptisms, who is no stranger to complexity, asks us to walk with him into the transition zone between what we have always known and what is yet coming into being. The tension that we are called to explore as a community of believers is how to balance the inherent goodness of creation and our charge of being good stewards of this one precious world that God has entrusted to us, along with the unique ways in which we are shaped culturally into the people we are today. To balance those things with the call to live into the redeemed life of eternity on earth as we will in heaven. That is a hard tension to hold. And most of us recoil from the complexity and choose one side or the other. A refusal to live into the messiness of this complexity can manifest both as a desire to discount all that came before or the desire to resist faithful changes that lead to a more beloved community. The church needs both. Both those who observe and name the way that God has been faithful to us in the past, and we need those who are eager to live into heaven's promises today. In a nation of hyper-partisanship, and a Western world that thrives on competition, we Americans may be particularly challenged to live into this tension. So how do we do it? How do we who faithfully gather in St. Paul's Burlingame and in the Diocese of California become spiritually mature disciples of Jesus who can thrive in the tension between the great dualities, especially the duality of life and death itself. A first step is to spend time reflecting on scripture together as a community of faith and acknowledging that our ancestors in the faith, regardless of how different their context and ages were from ours, those ancestors had to negotiate the same complexity in their day. The communion of saints that we remember and reconnect with at every Eucharist, and especially on All Saints and All Souls Day, is filled with those who live the contours of the already and not yet dynamic on earth and now know it fully and face to face in heaven. This might be a source of comfort for us as we can take heart knowing that we don't make this journey in toward maturity alone, but instead with a great cloud of witnesses and maybe most importantly of all, companions. The more time we spend allowing the treasures of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience to influence our faith development, the more we will begin to view our daily lives through the lens of received wisdom. In doing so, we will begin to discern the difference between voices calling us to the false simplicity of dualism and voices calling us to incarnate the complexity of the beloved community in Christ. we will begin to recognize that our call to such complexity means 
breaking down the dividing walls that keep us apart. And it involves seeing the church's primary mission as nothing less than the transformation of the world by love's design and with God's gracious help. For this transformation to arise, we must be willing to be stewards of a community who holds the tension between forming new disciples and worshiping God in our churches and reaching out to partner with neighbors who may even be suspicious or resist our truth in the larger world. It means doing catechesis and liturgy well at St. Paul's and partnering with efforts like the Workers Resource Center in San Mateo. Not either or, both and. It means listening for the voice of Jesus that calls us to come forth from a world that follows Babylon's ethics and priorities into the new world of maturity and freedom that resurrection enables. How are you preparing to be a person who can live into the mystery of new life in Christ without abandoning the gifts that previous generations have passed on in their pursuit of that mystery? This question is at the very heart of what it means to follow Jesus as individuals and more importantly, as this larger body that we call church. We follow the one who wept at the loss of a loved one and raised him up from the grave. We follow the one who said that the greatest among us is not the one with the fanciest clothes or the more socially privileged position, but instead the one who serves. We follow the one who showed us that in dying, we rise to a new way of living. And the one in whom all complexity, all time, and all dualities hold together. Let us resolve this day to follow Jesus into that new reality as a connected people aware of the challenges, but undaunted by them. Let us look for ways to unbind those who have been called to new life, but are still restrained by death's garments. And let us instead bind ourselves to the one in whom all saints and souls hold together, the one who is both king and servant, the one who is human and divine, the master of complexity, Jesus the Christ. And let's be ready to welcome his guidance, both within and beyond the church in these years to come. Amen.